Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the middle of the week. It is good to spend this time with you. I got to tell you, it was a great, great Sunday last week. Um, it was so good to see everybody together. Um, everybody had a great attitude, and I know we're all under duress. All of this stuff and all the changes that we're having to go through and being ushered out and uh, social distancing and wearing masks and how difficult it is to sing with a mask on and all of those kinds of things. But everybody's spirit has been so good, so uplifting and so positive. And I, again, have got to, to just praise the leadership of this congregation, um, from our elders to everybody who's been involved in making these preparations of doing everything possible to make a safe environment but also an environment that we can focus on why we're here. And that's not to focus on our masks or anything like that. It's to focus on praising and serving our God. It's a great day. And I want to encourage any of you who uh, had some reticence in coming. Now, I'm not talking about those who need to stay home and live stream because of age, because of uh, underlying health issues, etc. You need to be where you are. But there are some who are maybe not in that age range, don't have those kinds of issues, but have some, just some concerns about getting out uh, in general. Um, I, I want you to know that so many good preparations have been uh, made to uh, in, in ensure the safety of everybody here as well as um, a positive environment, et cetera. So we certainly would uh, encourage you to come join us if, if that is... Uh, um, available to you because um, it's a great, great time and, it, and it's just it's just such a blessing to be together. Really excited about what we're going to be talking about today and I don't know of anything that can that would be more timely than to talk about um, God's use of pandemics, God's use of calamity, God's use of nature, uh, speaking specifically in a, in a kind of a negative way. Um, and the challenges that are involved in that, and those challenges are basically come down to one of two things. Is God involved in our pandemic? Is God involved in hurricanes ever? Is God involved in earthquakes ever? Um, and if so, is he always involved? Is, is it every time there's a hurricane or every time there's a tornado, um, is God behind it? Um, and if not, how do you know? And that's what we're going to discuss because I think we all understand on one level that just because Scripture stopped recording God's moving doesn't mean that he has ceased moving in our world. Um, God is the creator and sustainer of everything that is. Nothing that is held together will hold together without God uh, causing it to. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's working very diligently in our lives every day, in our environment every day, etc. I just want us to understand that the only way we knew that he was involved um, in the plagues in Egypt was because it was revealed to us. The only way we know that Babylon defeated um, Judah is because it was revealed to us. Um, so when we see God moving, and he reveals that to us, for, I think a lot of different reasons, but one is to show us uh, I'm, I'm not aloof, I'm involved. Um, but as I said, it does raise the issue of, yeah, but when do you attribute it to him, and when do you view it as uh, just a matter of nature being out of balance? All right, let's go back and let's ask this question. Has God ever used fire as judgment? Well, obviously he has. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Mount Carmel, has God ever used the flood as judgment? Well, we have the flood uh, in Noah's day. Has God ever used famine? Has God ever used pestilence, disease, flies, locusts? Has God ever used uh, poisonous snakes in the wilderness? Yes, people were bit by the snakes and they had to crawl out of their tents because Moses had uh, lifted up a bronze serpent with or a bronze um, stand with, with serpents on it, and they had to gaze upon that. God had used that to discipline them. Has he ever used drought? Obviously, did in Egypt, etc. cetera. Um, has God ever used wind? Yes, yeah, scripture talks about with the blast of his breath, he can destroy, I mean, really, 
you can have a scorched earth because God uses his breath. Um, Job's kids were partying in a house and wind came uh, and destroyed them. Uh, an act that uh, Satan brought about with permission of God. Um, and part of Job's concern was, were they faithful? Were they doing what they were supposed to be doing when that happened? So it's very apparent God has done those things. And it's very apparent that he's been involved in the world, especially when it comes to um, discipline his children. I want to talk about the difference. And, and, and if I use the word discipline or I use the word punishment, here's what I mean. God disciplines his children. God punishes pagans. God disciplines those that he loves and challenges in our lives, trials in our lives, calamities in our life are tests. And I think if we view them as discipline, then we are honoring God. And I'm going to describe that more uh, as we get to it. Um, but we've seen that God does move. Um, and, and so when we understand that he disciplines us, that's a good thing. The Hebrew writer is going to tell us about that. When he punishes pagans, when he punishes the nations, he's not trying to wake them up. He's not trying to correct them. He's trying to punish or destroy them. You see, part of the problem in our uh, legal justice system is we don't know what we're trying to do. Uh, there's two, two camps of when we send people to prison, are we trying to punish them or are we trying to discipline them? If we're trying to discipline them, then we're going to train them and all of those things to become uh, good citizens, productive citizens, and then turn them back out to do that. If we're punishing them, we're not trying to make better people out of them. We're trying to put them in a hole so that they can't mess with anybody else. In our criminal justice system, we have both of those. Now, what I want you to understand is Biblically speaking, discipline is for believers. It's for children. Punishment is for um, ne'er-do-wells. Punishment is for those who have, for long enough, have, have denied God or the, the cup of their iniquity is filled, and he just, like in Canaan, he just wipes them away. Now, let's go to the concept of the plagues. In the mid-1300s, 30% of the population of Europe was killed by the Black Plague. It was called the plague because many believed God was plaguing them. In other words, a plague is, the word plague, especially in Hebrew, means to strike someone, to hit someone. Um, so, the plague was God striking them. The instrument of that plague was the flies, uh, the uh, turning uh, the water to blood, the, uh, the boils, and all of those kinds of things. Um, those were the instruments, but those weren't the plagues. The plague was God striking Egypt over and over and over. Now, at the Renaissance, in the Renaissance was the rise of humanism. Um, and humanism is man's focus on man. So in, in the time of the Black Plague, there was such a concern among many that God is plaguing us. God is punishing us. We must be doing something wrong. Since the Renaissance, there has been a view that a plague is just an illness. It's a disease, and science will handle it. Science will find a solution for it. That was the rise of humanism. Humanism is we're going to take care of ourselves. We are our own Taskmasters, we're our own God, we're our own saviors, etc. I would really encourage you to read the writings of Francis Schaeffer. Um, there was a video series that was produced uh, called How Shall We Then Live? based upon the research of Francis Schaeffer. And what Schaeffer did is he showed how through history um, the mindset has changed, especially after the Renaissance. Before that, uh, art, architecture, everything was focused on indirectly glorifying God. Architecture was made of buildings with spires. And if you look at architecture all the way up toward the Renaissance, it, it was up and down, which, which is man and God. Since then, it has been like arches and things like that, that it, it starts with us and it ends with us. Um, and, 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 he, and he goes through and shows in art where, um, you know, think of the Sistine Chapel, think of the Madonna holding a baby and 
and a halo around the baby's head. That, that's, that's how you viewed things. And then after the Renaissance, it was the humanism. It was the rise of the beauty of uh, the human form or humanity, etc. And God was kind of pushed out of it. The same thing has happened in the view of um, looking at plagues. During the Great Plague, during the Black Plague, they viewed it, by and large, as a, a judgment of God. Since then, we have, the plague has become a bacteria. So in the 16, or in the 1300s, plague meant an act of God, punishment by God, or discipline by God. In, since the Renaissance, plague means the bacteria that caused the pandemic. Uh, Yersinia pestis is the name of the, the bacteria that caused the, the Black Plague. <clears throat> so if you look up plague in your dictionary, what it will refer you to is the Black Plague. What it will refer you to is Yersinia pestis. This is how the world word has changed because of humanism, the Renaissance, the science is going to handle it, etc. And I want to share with you in just a moment a, a, a quote that demonstrates that, I think, very well. But remember, plague means to smite, to touch, to strike, uh, to beat, all right? The plagues of Egypt were not water turned to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, pestilence, boils. Those weren't the plagues. The plagues was God striking Egypt. Those were the swords that he used. Those were the instruments of the plague. You know, my life, my whole life, I've thought plagues were lice, locusts, etc. That's not what the word means. Don't confuse the instrument with the one who is manipulating the instrument, and that was the concept. So, in in the mid 1300s, Western Europe, uh, so many people believed that God was plaguing them. Now, this quote from uh, History.com uh, in the History Channel. This quote sums up the difference between the way they looked at plague and the way we look at plague, uh, post-Renaissance, humanism, etc. Because they did not understand the biology of the disease, many people believe that the black death was a kind of divine punishment. Now notice that. Notice the juxtaposition. Because they didn't understand biology, many people believed the black death was a kind of divine punishment. Retributions for sin against the gods, such as greed, blasphemy, heresy, fornication, and worldliness. By this logic, by that logic, the only way to overcome the plague was to win God's forgiveness. Some people believe that the way to do this was to purge their communities of heretics, other troublemakers. So, for example, many thousands of Jews were massacred in 1348-1349. Thousands more fled to the sparsely populated regions of Eastern Europe where they could be relatively safe from the rampaging mobs in the cities. All right, they didn't know any better, we know better. They didn't understand biology, we understand biology. Because they didn't understand biology, they considered it an act of God. We're smarter than that today, is what he's saying. Guys, we don't understand the biology of the coronavirus. So we're presently, presently, we're in no better hands than they were during the, the Black Plague. The difference is that it may not take as long, may not take as long to figure out its biology because of the advances that we've made. However, let's keep this in context. In the last three months, almost half a million have died worldwide. It's almost 500,000 people. Five years of the plague, some 25 to 50 million people died worldwide. All right, those are estimates. They don't know exactly. Uh, somewhere in the range of 25 to 50. That's 5 to 10 million per year. All right, we're almost at half a million in three months. We know biology. We know better. If the rate continues, if our death rate continues with no spikes, as, as they're shouting at us that, that are going to happen, that would be 2 million by the end of the year. With spikes, we could e equally or easily be equal to the death rate of the Black Plague. And we know biology. 
Now that should be humbling to us because it doesn't matter what we know, we don't know about coronavirus. How many other potential uh, pestilences are there that don't have a 97% survival rate? How many are out there right now? We just don't know them. We haven't encountered them. Now, we do know that there are some viruses and some bacteria that we don't have cures for. Coronavirus right now is one of those, some of which are much more deadly than coronavirus. We're very lucky that uh, it is not deadlier than it is because it is so infectious. Guys, we don't know any more about it than doctors knew in 1340 about the Black Plague. But we know biology. We're smarter. We're not going to respond like they did that God is upset with us. Hmm. Deuteronomy 32. For a fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest parts of shale, consumes the earth with its yield, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine, consumed by plague, and bitter destruction. The teeth of beasts I will send upon them in the venom of crawling things of the dust. Now, here's a promise from Psalm 91 to you and me. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bore. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrows that flies by day, and of pestilence that, start, that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. You guys don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. If we understand how God moves, if we understand that he moves in our world, he is our Savior. He is our salvation. Thank God that he does move uh, in present day. Habakkuk 3, before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. Guys, I think it's important that when there is a worldwide pandemic, and these don't happen very often. Man, you look at history, I mean, you can only, probably on one at the most two hands, worldwide pandemics. I think it behooves us to ask, could this be from God? Now, we're going to talk about how to determine whether it is or isn't in just a moment. But I'm afraid in our culture, I'm afraid in Christendom, we're too humanistic to even ask the question. And, oh, no, 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 God doesn't work that way, or God doesn't. And I think part of the reason for that is there have been people who've gone overboard pointing at everything and saying this is an act of God. <clears throat> Every time a major calamitous event occurs, especially on a global level, religious weirdos come out. They overstay. The hurricane in North, North New Orleans was a judgment of that city because of its sin. That's, that's what came out from so many people, and the world scoffed at that, because if you're going to say that, what about the uh, tornado and more? Was that a judgment against more? Their assurance suggested, their assurance that this is an act of God, uh, and, and every time there's a calamity like that, especially in a place that's known for uh, rebellion to God or whatever, some religious folks come out and they say that was an act of God. Well, how do you know that? And that suggests they either have revelation from God or they've just got a bias and they're looking for where to apply their bias. And we're going to talk about how to not get into that, how to not fall into that trap, but not responding to that trap by saying, well, that's not from God at all. Because we've already shown how he moves. And history is filled with... Um, revelations of how God used uh, nature, and, and, and especially when he used nature when it was out of balance. <clears throat> we tend to respond with skepticism. How do they think they know for sure? So God's, God's we know God's use of calamity is without doubt. We've, we've demonstrated that. We're not going to spend more time demonstrating that because uh, all you have to do is read the Bible, not just the Old Testament, 
you know, go to the book of Revelation and look at his judgment against Babylon and all those kinds of things, how he's going to use everything at his disposal and everything's at his disposal uh, to judge them, etc. But when do you know that God is using a calamity, especially in modern times? Again, the only way we know in the Old Testament he was behind those things is because he told us. The only way we know that God was behind the ten plagues in Egypt is because he demonstrated that to us through Moses. So there's three worldviews about how do we deal with calamity? How do, what, what should our perspective of this worldwide pandemic be? The first worldview is nature works on its own, seeking balance without anything from God. This is deism. God created the earth. He got it going, and then he sat back, and he is not working in it any longer. So what happens in the world is just laws of nature that God set up, and when that gets out of balance because of the fall, you know, when, when weather gets out of balance, you may have a tornado or, or, or a storm. When, when the uh, geological plates get out of balance, you may have an earthquake to restore balance, etc. So the deistic view is that God doesn't do anything anymore. Um, and again, that's a belief that although we never said this, and no, the prophets never said it, it's a belief that by 90 AD, when God quit uh, inspiring the word to be written, he quit working in the world. And I think that's ludicrous. The second worldview is that God causes all calamity, that each one is a wake-up call. So there is nothing that happens that's bad without it being discipline or judgment. I think the challenge with that is the consistency or the inconsistency of who's at the hands of it because there's sometimes that God's people uh, end up with, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. That doesn't mean it's a judgment from God. The third worldview is sometimes nature balances itself. Sometimes God brings a calamity. Or sometimes there's a calamity and God uses it as discipline slash judgment. The only assurance is, number one, God either is not involved in any calamity, or number two, he's involved in every calamity. If you hold to those, then you have assurance. You can say, oh, that's an act of nature. You can say, well, that's an act of God. Now, the challenge is going to be backing that up. The third view is sometimes nature balances itself, sometimes God brings calamity. And I think that's probably, everybody that I'm talking to, that's probably what you believe. That sometimes nature gets out of balance and you have a storm. It's not necessarily a judgment on the people who are there. <clears throat> but sometimes, as we've seen in Scripture, God brings his judgment on people through calamity. So how do you, how do you understand? How do, how do you determine that? Um, that seems that worldview seems to bring confusion and uncertainty. Uh, so one person says, well, that's, that's an act of God. Somebody else, no, that's an act of nature. And you and I could even disagree on that. The response, I believe, is to give what's called the Hebrews, or what I call the Hebrews 12 test. Understanding that God disciplines those that he loves, and he punishes those eventually that he opposes. Now, he's going to punish them on the, the final day, but there's punishments. There's punishment for Canaan. There was punishment for um, Rome, for uh, Greece, for all of those empires, for Assyria, for Babylon, etc. There were there's, there's punishment in our day, and then there's eternal punishment on the final day. The Hebrew writer encourages us to submit to the discipline of God. Now, now we're children, and we're going to look at the scripture, but he disciplines children. And since we're children of God, uh, the Hebrew writer encourages us to submit to his discipline as a good thing. It's a good thing that he's disciplining us. Now, as the Hebrew writer makes clear, nobody likes discipline, but the outcome of it is a good thing. To count every challenge, every negative, as from God, to count it as from God, and to reflect. That's what discipline is for. It's to get us to stop and think about what we're doing or what we did, and to consider consequences of it, and to, to change our direction. That's one of the differences between discipline and punishment. Punishment, you don't sit down with someone and say, do you understand what you did? Do you understand why you got spanked? Um, whereas training or discipline is, 
son, daughter, do you understand what you did wrong? What could you have done different? That's the training aspect. That's the discipline aspect of it. So I believe God uses discipline on believers and punishment for enemies. I don't think that God ever intends to convince pagans through calamity that he's God. I think he just punishes them. Um, but he may discipline us to reorient us to reach to pagans so that they don't remain as pagans. Um, so God is, is giving us a wake-up call so that we can give the world a wake-up call before he punishes more of the world. So Hebrews 12, 4, the Hebrews 12 test. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. You've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as my as son. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Scourges, it's a tough word. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were as without discipline, for which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time. It seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, <clears throat> afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak, the knees that are feeble, and make straight the paths of your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. The purpose of the discipline is things are going wrong. We need to straighten that up before you end up dead, before you end up destroyed. So you're demonstrating weakness. Strengthen it up. Use God's discipline to do that. I think what the Hebrew writer is saying is, if it's a challenge, if it's negative, attribute it to God's discipline. But what if he's not behind it? What have you lost? You see, the whole point of discipline is that reflection, that learning. So if we say to one another, what if God's behind this pandemic? Then we need to reflect. Are we doing what we need to be doing? Are we focusing on what we need to focus on? Because we understand that as sheep, it's easy for us to wander. We understand there are slippery slopes. We understand that it's easy to get off course, that it's easy to get uh, our priorities wrong. But if we reflect, then we can challenge one another in that. Guys, I love being part of the American Restoration Movement. I'm very proud to be, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way, I'm proud to be a part of the American Restoration Movement because the idea is <clears throat> we're going to continually go back to Scripture and challenge ourselves. Are we doing what Scripture said? We're not going to say, all right, we studied that and we've written it off, so we don't have to come back and visit that. We're going to keep coming back to remind us. Uh, Peter wrote, I, I'm, I'm not bringing anything new to you. I'm stirring you to remembrance. So much of what Paul wrote was remedial. Get back. Straighten up, do right, get right church and come home. That's a good process. And if we attribute challenges to God, it will cause us to do that. And regardless of whether he's behind it or not, if we just account it that he is, we accept it as discipline and we get the training and the reflection that we need to get. In the 90s and into the 2000s, so many corporations in the United States came up with vision statements and mission statements. And the reason for that is because it was very easy for them to get off track. What are we doing here? Back when I was in the restaurant business working in Jack in the Box um, in Seattle, I managed a store there and one of the things that the company that owned Jack in the Box, they, they, they came and they said, we want to ensure quality. So here's what we're going to do. Everything that's in the restaurant is going to get a label, and the label is going to be an expiration date. So uh, like shredded lettuce was 24 hours. Um, you know, a mayonnaise was three months. So 
every container was labeled and it was the responsibility of management to go check all of these labels consistently to make sure that everything was well, there are so many different products that it took so much time for management to do that that customer service suffered because our focus became uh, expiration dates rather than taking care of the customer. <clears throat> and what they began to realize was we've lost our focus here. Um, we are expecting our managers to do something that doesn't allow them to manage at all. It's requiring them to do something that puts product, um, product labels ahead of everything else. And I think every, every nation can fall into that. Every business can fall into that. Every church can fall into that. That we lose our focus. One of the things that I find humorous is uh, making competition shows. I don't know why everything has to be a competition, but... Um, and one that I used to watch was <clears throat> these cakes. People, they had chefs on there and they would make these cakes. And several things had to take place. One, and everybody's cake was, you know, you'd have a dragon, you, you would have a castle scene, the dragon from it, and the fire coming out of the dragon's mouth and all of that. And these things were so ornate. And then one of the things that they had to do was pick it up and move it from one table to the next without it falling. So it had to be structurally sound and all of that. And you know what? None of that had anything to do with what a cake's supposed to taste like. And ultimately, a cake is supposed to taste good. But they were using things like fondant. You ever eaten fondant? Man, give me buttercream frosting anytime over fondant. But they would use fondant because they could make things out of it. And as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, in those competition, they lost the purpose of a cake. And a cake is to sit down with your friends and to have dessert. And dessert means deserved. You ate your meal, you, you cleaned your plate, now you deserve a treat. It's not a treat if you can't eat it. It's not a treat if it uh, doesn't taste good. And that's an illustration of what can happen. We can lose our focus trying to do this on top of trying to do that. And the focus can become this rather than that. And guys, I want to suggest to you, it was a waste of time. Because it wasn't about making great cakes. It was about making cakes that didn't look like cakes that nobody could eat. It can happen. It can happen so easily. Guys, in a time when there has been so much prosperity, in a time surrounded by so much humanism, in a time when there's rising persecution and hatred against the name of Jesus, it's easy for us to lose focus of why we're here. It's easy for us to lose an understanding of our mission. And our mission's been very clear. So I believe when we see a pandemic, we need to ask ourselves, are we doing what God wants us to do? And are we sure? The only way we can be sure is to go back to scripture and to go back to look at what does he want us to be? What does he want our mission to look like? What does he want our worship to look like? What does he want our obedience to him to look like? And we can do that. Scripture wasn't written to be confusing. As a result of that, we can ask ourselves questions. Have we become a bunkered people where we have church within the walls, um, but where's the outreach outside of the walls? And by outreach, I'm not talking about benevolence. I'm talking about seeking and saving that which is lost because we can feed folks and they end up lost in hell. What good have we done? And as I talked about last week, I think everything that we do should be toward the end of seeking and saving that which is lost. That's the Great Commission. That is our co-mission statement. Um, the three parts of um, the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. That's all discipleship. It is getting them saved, keeping them saved, using the gospel and using scripture in order to do that. And that's what we're to be about. 
are we doing that? Are we doing that to the extent that we need to be? Can I make a confession to you? It's almost embarrassing to me now to share with people that I lived almost 10 years in Seattle. When I see what's going on in Seattle right now, when I see how um, very liberal snowflakes have gotten into leadership positions and, and et cetera, it's embarrassing. When I see what's happening with Chaz and all of that, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google that, and you're gonna see, you're just gonna see nonsense taking flight. When I see that, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to be associated with Seattle. I understand the Northwest is, is the most, probably the most liberal place uh, in the United States. I'm not surprised by it, but I am embarrassed. And guys, it causes me in reflection when I see those people acting that way on television, it causes me to ask the question, what if the church, and I mean the church in uh, Bellevue, the, the church in West Seattle, the church in Federal Way, the Central Church, the Highline Church, which I was associated with, and Charlotte and I helped plant. What if we had made the impact on that culture that Paul did on pagan cultures in his day. Would Seattle be different? Yes. Yes. And I know your response is, but you guys did the best you could, and it's a wicked and perverse generation. I understand that. I understand that. But I think in reflection, and that's what I'm doing, I'm reflecting. I'm reflecting because of what I see is a social pandemic in Seattle. Is... Are we doing here what we need to be doing? Are we fulfilling our ministry? Are we changing the world? Or have we turned into a bunker out of fear? Guys, that's what pandemics, that's what challenges, that's what fires burning downtown should get us to do, is to say, we're going to attribute this to God. Now, what is it he would have us learn? And it doesn't matter whether or not God caused that specific hurricane or that specific earthquake. I do think we, it, it's a great question when there is a global pandemic. But the response of the church should be, is this a wake-up call? Well, how do we know? Let's go to Scripture. Have we gotten away what we need to? Do we need to restore more? Do we need a reformation of the restoration movement? Are we still light and salt? Are we different from the world or have we compromised with the world? If we have, then we're rejecting the discipline that the pandemic is bringing. Brothers and sisters, what if, what if this pandemic is a wake-up call? What if, like in Egypt, there are nine more? What if God is attacking in our world the gods that have replaced him, the gods of believing in humanism and science to heal all our wounds, and the belief in our economy and that we can make our own way through monetary means? What if God, with a simple organism we can't even see, is tearing down both of those? What if this pandemic is leading to um, a depression. Nobody's talking about the ultimate cost economically of what's happening in the world. There's already been predictions of uh, businesses going under, and our government can't keep borrowing money to keep a free enterprise thing going. I mean, it's ludicrous. But we're not even talking about the potential long-term economic devastation of, of this pandemic. And we really can't look at it until we have found an inoculation or a cure for it because we're going to still have to keep things slow and separate and protected and all of those kinds of things. Read today that Hertz, number two automobile uh, leasing company, has filed for bankruptcy because this is putting them out of business. There's going to be so many snowfalls. What if God is attacking our belief in science, our belief in humanism, and our trust in the economy and undermining it. Now, here's the promise.
James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I want to go back to the psalm passage that we read earlier that God protects us. Brothers and sisters, we can be smart by wearing masks. We can be smart by social distancing, but we must not live in fear of anything because God is our deliverer. And God will use whatever to wake us up if we need to be waken up. But in the presence of that, when we acknowledge him and glorify him, when we put on sackcloth and ashes when we need to, he protects us. He is our rock and our fortress. Yeah, but Steve, just like in the first century, the fall of Jerusalem, Christians died and did what? What can this virus do to you? It can make your life sick for a while. It can send you to be with God. Where's the fear of the virus? Where's the fear of even contracting it and all that? I'm either going to survive it here or I'm going to survive it there. I'm either going to spend time longer with you. And this is the, this is the challenge Paul had. Uh, in, in the first chapter of Philippians, is it better to stay here with you or better to go be with the Lord? You can't lose in that kind of a situation. God is our provider. He's already taken care of the outcome of this. If we will submit to him. Did this pandemic come from God? We have history of a lot of them that did. If we attribute it to God, we will learn. If we don't attribute it to God, We'll never learn the lessons. We'll never accept the discipline that he's presenting to us because of our humanism. Because after all, after the Renaissance, we understand things that those poor people uh, didn't understand in 1340s. We're better people, aren't we? Or are we just people? Live in peace. Live in joy. Don't be afraid. Victory's already been won. This pandemic cannot destroy you. Now, don't listen to all the, the, the howling, wailing of a world that doesn't know God who's living in fear that it can destroy them. It can destroy no one who is in Christ Jesus. Praise God for that. Brothers and sisters, have a great rest of your week. If you can be there Sunday, I'd love to see you even behind a mask. It's great when we're together. God bless you, and God bless you with peace and joy, even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of pandemic. I love you.